Welcome to the Kansas City Public Library. I'm Henry Fortunato, Director of Public Affairs. By the power vested in me by Crosby Kemper III, <laughs> I now call to order the charter session of the restored Kansas City Anti-Saloon League. <laughs> the main event will be my lecture, The Pleasure of Prohibition. <laughs> giving in to the temperance temptation. <laughs> Following my talk, there'll be a floor show featuring 10 women impersonating Carrie Nation. <laughs> I should warn you that this will be an audience participation activity. Like St. Carrie, each of these women will be wielding axes. <laughs> They'll be looking for your bottles. First aid stations are located throughout the building. Actually, I'm sorry, that's incorrect. That's tomorrow night's program. <laughs> Tomorrow is redemption night. Tonight, we indulge. Tonight, in fact, our continuing quest to stretch the envelope of what constitutes legitimate library programming We've taken our most audacious step yet. Tonight, you might say, we've put the pub in the public library. <laughs> and based on tonight's turnout, you're giving me great ideas for Oktoberfest. Truly, you can't, you can't get this kind of stuff anywhere else, right? Can you? Which is to say, if our incredibly clever stratagem of enticing you here in August with the promise of some boulevard beer is the first time you've come to the library, fill out a card. <laughs> get on our list. In the high season, we do this sort of thing two or three times a week. <laughs> Usually with wine, but I'm open to other beverages. Which gets us to tonight's program. There are few contemporary entrepreneurs in Kansas City who are more iconic than John McDonald. In little more than 20 years, he's taken a dream and built an empire. As his sister, Carrie McDonald, who works here at the library, once told me, of John, it was often said, he's too nice a guy to run a business. Well, here's proof that nice guys can and do finish first. Indeed, the extraordinary success of Boulevard Brewing Company is testimony to the fact that the entrepreneurial imperative is alive and well, and that Kansas City, in the memorable words of Carl Schramm, president and CEO of the Ewing Marion Coffin Foundation, remains a cradle of entrepreneurs. In tonight's public conversation, conducted by my dear friend and esteemed colleague, Crosby Kemper III, you'll hear John's story. It's quite a tale, and in many ways, an unlikely one. Listen closely to the childhood part. Lots of um, experiments with home brewing kits <laughs> in his parents' basement. Not to mention early adventures in salesmanship to thirsty teenagers at the drive-in movie in Osborne, Kansas. <laughs> and much of this when he was 12. <laughs> Tonight, we hope you'll learn something you didn't know, but in all honesty, we really hope you'll be inspired. Inspired to pursue your own entrepreneurial vision. And if you are, come back tomorrow. Go upstairs to the third floor of this building. That's where we've built the H&R Block Business and Career Center. There are all... <laughs> there are all manner of materials, resources, and hands-on help to get you started. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Crosby Kemper and John McDonald. 
Well, free beer in the public library, is this a great country or what? <laughs> really good free beer. Uh, you know, uh, my, my father, <clears throat> uh, my father uh, taught me a, a lot about the banking business. I was a banker. In fact, I was one of John's bankers uh, uh, before uh, becoming a librarian. And my father taught me that local business is good, Local collateral is good. Local collateral that you can touch and feel and smell and taste is really, really good. <laughs> Liquid assets are the best. <laughs> so he always really liked the, the, uh, the Boulevard uh, credit. I, I, do, I do want to say that a couple of uh, John's real bankers are, uh, are here tonight. Uh, Peter De Silva, who is the CEO of UMB Bank, uh, is here. Peter. Thank you. Doug Page, the Chief Credit Officer of UMB, uh, is here, and I thank them for, uh, for continuing the, the, uh, the tradition of loaning on those liquid assets so the rest of us can enjoy them. Um, I also uh, I want to I start by taking you back to uh, July of 2008, an important moment in the history of Missouri and Missouri Brewing, because it was in July of, two, July of 2008 You, you're from northern Missouri, I can tell. Um, uh, Missouri or Missouri, in any case, we all know what we're talking about. Uh, in, in July of 2008, uh, John McDonald and Boulevard Brewery became the largest brewery uh, in the state of Missouri, replacing a, a small uh, local brewery in St. Louis that sold out to a Belgian brewer for $52 billion. And as you all know, John makes much better beer than those people in St. Louis. So you can imagine how much he's worth today. But, but it wasn't always that easy. And so I want to take you back, John. I want to take you back to that moment, 1989 or 1990, when you just started the brewery, were delivering in the, in the, in the back of your pickup truck kegs to local taverns, neighborhood taverns. And, and tell us the story of your delivery to the Twin City Tavern in 1989, when you might not have been able to imagine becoming the largest brewery in the state of Missouri. Well, uh, you know, it was a, a year or so after we'd started the brewery, and we had draft beer only in Kansas City. And uh, we did have a, a delivery guy, but uh, he was always on task and hated to change his route. So uh, a lot of times I'd have to uh, take a keg of beer out if a bar or restaurant would uh, blow a keg. So I went to this Twin City Tavern, a guy named Mike Renner, and I think Mike's probably still around. He was he used to own Mike's Tavern over on Troost. And Mike was a really a great bar owner. He taught me several things. One that one of the things that he always did is he paid cash. Actually, Kansas City is a, uh, Missouri is a term state for alcohol, so, and we were struggling, so if you want to know about cash flow, you know, cash when you deliver is a great thing. So, <laughs> but he, he taught me that if you're a bar owner, two things you probably should do is always pay cash, and if you were prone to alcoholism, you shouldn't drink. <laughs> and, and I think Mike had quit drinking years and years before, and so he was a pretty smart guy. But anyway, it was about 11 o'clock in the morning, and there were three old guys sitting at the bar. And I went in, and, and of course, it was a, just a small three-keg draft box. And he had Bush, only Bush on tap, and then he had our, I think, pale ale or our wheat beer. I don't remember which one. And so about 11 o'clock in the morning, these three old guys are in there, and they're drinking their 12-ounce glasses with no foam on the beer. You know, they don't want to get cheated out of that half inch of, <laughs> of foam, you know, which is a horrible thing. And so, you know, fill it to the top, and they were, they probably drank a keg a week between the three of them. <laughs> and um, so anyway, Mike says to uh, these three guys, look, this young man has started this business just three or four blocks from here, and you really should help him out. 
and uh, you should at least try his beer. And you know, it's great beer. And so he pours them all three, a glass of beer, pushes it across the bar to him. One guy wouldn't even drink it. He wouldn't even try it. And the other two guys tried it and then pushed the beer back across the bar and just went back to drinking bush. And so I thought, oh, my God, what have I done, you know? Uh, I am not going to be able to pay the bank back or my investors. You know, this is going to be horrible, you know. This is horrible. And so I was already feeling pretty bad, but as I was going out the door, one of the guys turns to me and he says, Young man, that is absolutely the worst beer I've ever had in my life. <laughs> so, so I felt just horrible going out the door. But, you know, years later, I went back to Twin City Tavern, and we had two or three handles and sold a lot of beer there. And I thought, all three of those guys are dead. And, <laughs> and you know, if, if they had just drank Boulevard beer, they might still be here. But no, I'm just kidding. No, can't make that kind of promise. That's illegal. So, so th th this is a great story about how to get ahead in the beer business. Sorry. But, okay, so now, now, now we shift to the state of Kansas. Did I pronounce that correctly? Yeah. Um, uh, and, and, and what I want to know is how, to, how does Missouri's greatest brewer get started in the state of Kansas? Your, your, your background, as, as Henry pointed out, Kerry Nation is from Kansas. The Prohibition Party is still on the ballot in Kansas. You know, and, and uh, so it, your family background, uh, where, you, know, where, you grew up in a small town. Well, I grew up in a small town in uh, north central Kansas called Osborne. My father moved there as an engineer for the highway department. And uh, that's where I grew up. And, you know, in a small town of a couple thousand people in north central Kansas, there wasn't a lot to do. And beer drinking became something we all did. And, uh, and, and my fr from the early age that Henry mentioned, like 12, you were drinking? Is this true? Probably. My father uh, actually made home brew. Statute of limitations is running out. Don't uh, worry. The beer was so bad that he didn't personally drink it. It was more in our basement as a conversation piece. So, but we did. There, there are rumors you know, there were explosions in your basement from time to time, in fact. Um, but, you know, a little tomato juice. Uh, they call it red beers. It's a popular thing in Kansas. Sounds horrible to a lot of people, but if you grew up in north central Kansas, it was a popular thing in the tavern. So, so we made a little beer, and I learned how to make beer there. And then when we were, I think, in junior high, we uh, started making beer, and a friend of mine's, I don't think my parents would let me do this, but this friend of mine who came from a big Catholic family, uh, we were raising pigeons and quail and stuff in a pigeon pen, but we also were making beer in his basement, and we would take it out to the drive-in on the weekends and sell it to the high school kids. <laughs> and uh, sales were so good at one point that we decided, we ran out of beer that was finished, so we went back to the basement and bottled up a bunch of green, really green fermenting beer and sold it to the uh, high school kids, and then we had to lay low for a couple weeks. Uh, <laughs> <clears throat> until their stomachs got better, I think, and they'd forgotten. So, yeah, anyway. the the, uh, the great the great epidemic in Osborne, that I think is known. Yeah. So, so you 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 go and and this may also help ex explain how you became a, a brewer. You go to KU. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, a fourth or fifth generation uh, uh, Jayhawk, right? Yes. But your father, who's an engineer might have been a little uh, uh, skeptical about your, your career path at that point because you were an art student? You know, my father was upset with me when I went to... Well, first of all, I didn't join a fraternity. He was very upset about that. And then um, I became an art student, and he was really upset about that. And, but, you know, it was something I was interested in, and, you know, I wasn't a good student, so it was uh, a way to compensate for my inabilities in other areas, you know. But you were probably a wine drinker at, uh, if you were an art student, right? I mean, no, you beer. know, wine, I drank a little wine, but, uh, you know, actually, one of the things, and I know this is a touchy subject in America today, but, you know, I drank enough beer when I was young that by the time I got to college, I really, you know, could have a beer once in a while, and, and that was, which Stay awake through get, exams? Which helped me get through college, you know. Okay. 
So you're, you're an art student with a taste for beer, uh, but you, en you ended up coming into Kansas City and working as a carpenter. You know, that's true. Uh, after I got out of college, I did spend a couple years in South America traveling around, which was a very formative time for me. And then came back, and then when I was out of money, I came back to Kansas City and uh, became a carpenter. Uh, you know, really basic stuff in the beginning, building decks and painting houses and that kind of thing. And, and, and so you're, 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 you're doing this carpentry business and fixing up houses and whatnot. What's the inspiration? What's the moment of inspiration to become a brewer? Well, there were several moments. Uh, you know, one I can think of is one of the first things that was an evolution for me at that time was, you know, I was a pretty poor guy. I couldn't always afford to buy imported beers. And, and I was kind of going that way. So a guy told me once that a, a really great way to make beer taste better was you buy the cheapest case of beer in the liquor store, and then you buy a six-pack of Guinness bottles, and you pour one-fourth of a of a bottle in each, you know, <laughs> of Guinness into the, the, the uh, cheap beer and into a glass. And, and you know, that's one of the things that, uh, as a small brewer, is a big challenge for us. We feel like through all the millions and millions of advertising dollars that have got us all to drink beer out of a bottle, you know, if you can just get people to drink beer out of a glass, that's a huge thing. Uh, so, you know, I think that was probably one of the beginning uh, things that happened to me when I first started. Yeah, you, you do tell this story uh, that I've read that uh, you found yourself on the job, some of, the, some of these jobs where you're doing renovations, taking a six pack or a case uh, of beer uh, to, to the job and finding out that at the end of the day you left a lot of half drunk uh, cans or bottles of beer. Actually, Crosby, that's not totally true. I never drank on the job. Sorry. <laughs> after the no, job. No, really. Excuse uh, me. After there, the job. There, yeah, that was when I would be at home at night fixing up my old houses that I lived fixing in. Fixing up your and, house, sorry. And eating Oreo cookies and, you know. But, but actually, I was in the... I learned from an early time that you shouldn't drink and saw. Or drill, <laughs> for that matter. Uh, there was... There, one time I was in the lumber yard at Shooty Lumber, and there was an old guy in front of me. And he had a, you know, a half pint of, like, old... Granddad or something in his back pocket, and he also had about two and a half digits on each hand. <laughs> and uh, anyway, I talked to him about it, and uh, and this guy worked for a millwork company. And if you know what a shaper, a spindle shaper is, it's a scary piece of equipment. Has this blade that's running around at this high rate of speed, and he had one that didn't have locking teeth in it. He just clamped it down tight. And I said, well, what do you do if, 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 if it blows up? And he goes, you got to be really quick. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway. Okay, well, another, another story I've been told by, by, by a, uh, a source close to the, uh, uh, to, to the truth uh, is that you won a raffle. You and Anne, your wife Anne, uh, won a, ra a couple of tickets in a raffle, World Airways tickets, to fly to the land of good craft beer. That's true. My wife is very lucky. She finds stuff all the time. And uh, so a friend and I, we went out to the airport, and we went out and sat at the bar and drank beer, but she got involved in the raffle and won these two tickets. And so um, we, and it was to go any place in the world. So that was really my first trip to Europe. And, and we went to the great beer drinking countries, uh, England and Germany, and, and we didn't go to Belgium. And then we went to France. So... And in France, the, the Luxembourg Gardens, and? Well, and my wife, uh, she loves to, uh, she's a great tourist. She loves to go to museums and uh, experience things like that. I'm good for maybe one museum a day, and then I want to go to the park or the bar and have a few drinks and see that side of life. And so... I would go, a lot of times there was a little Belgian beer bar near Luxembourg Gardens. It's still there today, actually. The last time I was in France, it was still there. And I went there, and that's one of the things that really blew me away as to the, uh, you know, the diversity of beer from the little country of Belgium. You know, uh, a country half the size of the state of Kansas that at that time probably there were over 100 breweries producing four or 500 very distinctly different beers. And so, you know, it's hard to drink that many beers in a week or two in Paris. But, 
You know, I tried. You forced yourself. Yeah, I forced myself. Research, research. Because the librarian's heart good to hear this dedication to research. And, and in England, the English bitters and the pub life. It's also, it's kind of a, there's a different social aspect to the way they drink in pubs and in the cafes than, than maybe American bars, or at least American bars, say, in the, in the 70s and 80s. Oh, absolutely. I think, uh, you know, in, in Europe, you know, drinking is definitely more a way of life than it is a, a sin, you know, like in the United States. And, um, you know, we have a, our Belgian brewer, Stephen Powell's, you know, he's constantly, because uh, he grew up drinking beer as a kid, and, and uh, so he thinks this is pretty crazy how we treat drinking in the United States. So you come back to the United States after experiencing the beer culture, this, the, the diversity, the craft beers, uh, the, the freshness of the beers, too, I think you've said in the, in the past, and <clears throat> those countries. And there's a revival or, of craft beers going on in the United States. Sam Adams, Anchor, uh, 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 and uh, Sierra Nevada, and the, and, and the others. And t tell us about that, what was going on in the United States at that well, point. Well, you know, when I got back, it was coincident coincidental, actually, Ann and I went and had dinner at a friend of ours who works at the brewery now, Peyton Kelly. And, you know, he had home brew in his, at this dinner party that we went to. And, you know, I was kind of impressed with that. And then uh, we went on to kind of become home brewers, really in a just a fun way. And it wasn't until several years later when I really was more interested in started the, starting the brewery that I became really a serious home brewer. And, you know, the home brewing uh, world today is huge. Um, there's a lot of, you know, brewers that make fantastic beers at the home level. Mm -hmm. But you, you decided to start an actual microbrewery or craft brewery. And, uh, and, and, and so you're looking around for money, you're looking around for help, you're looking around for partners. How does that go? Well, it was, it was not as easy. If you went out and said I was gonna, you were going to start a small brewery today, you would have people that would be interested in investing, banks that would be interested in loaning. Uh, in 89, not so much. And so, you know, I went down a few wrong paths in the beginning, but then and almost gave up the project several times. And then finally just said, you know, I really am interested in this. I really want to do it. And I went out and got, oh, I don't know, uh, sold uh, limited partnership shares to uh, mostly friends and family and um, went to the banks. Uh, at that time, I went to lots of banks. I didn't even go to UMB then because everybody told me there's no way UMB would loan you any money. <laughs> So I think that's hilarious, but uh, they ult ultimately became our bank. And it was funny Liquid because assets. if you've got a really bad deal, uh, I think bankers love to send you to their, their favorite competitor. You know, because <laughs> I was always amazed, you know, because I'd go to one bank and that banker would say, you know, this bank might make this loan. I think it's a great idea, but, yeah. you, know, we, you know, we just aren't going to do it. But there's a bank down the street, and I'm sure they would love to loan you the money, so... Well, yeah. one one of the stories that uh, that I've been told, uh, your sister your sister told me this that uh, you 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 weren't going to take no for an answer. And in fact, your partner in the carpentry business, uh, what one of your partners, Dan Harden, is that right? Yeah. Uh, once once said that he wanted to hit you on the head to stop you. <laughs> you you're just going all the time. You wouldn't you wouldn't stop. So that that must be you must have you must have convinced some people to put some money into the into the business. And so you started up. And and you're you're going and and you, what's the 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 key to the to, to making the startup go? You started selling out of the back of your truck to local taverns and bars. Well, you know, really, I I, I think I did. You know, one of the good things about it, ba the banks not giving me any money that took about six months. So going in and talking to all these bankers, I really had polished my spiel. You know, so by the you know, so I really and, and they would say things like. Well, how do you know that the uh, bars will actually buy beer from you? And they'd say, why don't you go do a study and, and ask them? So, you know, I'd gone out and done a lot of those kinds of things, only to find out that only a few of the bars that actually said they would buy the beer from us actually did in the beginning. And the same thing with investors, of course. Uh, you know, one thing, if you've ever gone out and tries to, tried to raise money from people, uh, it's not easy. And it's really not easy to get the first one 
to give you the money because nobody wants to be the idiot that was the first person to invest in some dumb thing. And I remember after a couple of weeks of having my business plan together and going out and hitting the street, um, I came back very uh, dejected. And my wife, Ann, actually uh, <coughs> said, honey, I'll buy a half a share. And so, <laughs> so, you know, she bought a half a share from me, which gave me a, uh, a little optimism, <laughs> even though, you know, it's hard to say, well, uh, yeah, I've sold a half a share. And then it's like, well, who bought it? Uh, well, because they want to hear somebody like, you know, some, some smart investor like Warren Buffett or something. And you, well, my girlfriend, <laughs> you know. So anyway, that was kind of tough. But it was, it was a real interesting uh, time raising money. Well, and, and you know, you hit a wave of, 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 of craft beers. And, 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 and talk for a second about the difference between what you were doing and what Anheuser-Busch was doing and Miller was doing and... You know, which is really the secret of your success. You, you made beer in a different way. Well, I think, you know, and I think this be, has become more and more evident to me um, now than then. I think then I really didn't know what I was doing. But I did know that, you know, I liked the idea of, you know, handmade, local, regional. All those things were something I was interested in, even though I didn't sell I didn't know that to say it then. And I think, though, as I've seen uh, the success of not just us, but other small breweries across the country, um, it makes me realize how important it is, you know, for us here in America. You know, this drive that we've really been on of globalization that really goes back to, you know, my parents' generation. You know, the end game of that is just a few giant players that don't really care about anything but returning money to the stockholders of their giant companies. And that probably isn't a good thing for any of us long term. And so I think it's showing itself a little bit in the beer business today, but we need to figure out a way to make that happen, I think, in other areas of commerce in the United States. And, and you know, you, you, the Chinese said to me at one point, I thought it was, a, it was a great line, there was a shift in the, in the view of the brewers. I mean, I, there's a great tradition in Anheuser-Busch for a long time of, of them seeing themselves as brewers. But over time, as they got bigger and they fooled with the formula to get the right formula, the, the right kind of Pilsner light beer formula for for mass American taste, they, sh they shifted, you said, from being brewers to being chemists. Right. And I think that, 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 that's a great, a great line. And, and so you, you, defeating the expectations of the Twin City Tavern guys, you, you've, you've grown uh, over time to be, to be one of the largest brewers in the country. And, uh, but you've had some, some interesting bumps along the way. The 2004 uh, beer uh, 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 scare, where you, you almost, you ran out of beer, or you were about to run out of beer in 2004? Well, frankly, we're about ready to run out of beer, it seems like, every six months. So, you know, Hence we're almost, the need for future we're almost used to it, bankers. but, uh, yeah, you know, it's uh, been a juggling act of, you know, adding, you know, people and expertise and, you know, keeping the quality of the beer. And, and you know, as a, you know, if, if you're not just a big, mass brewer and you know they are very smart people and do an amazing job it's hard to take any you know it's hard to take something away from a company that can sell uh, uh what is it 400 million barrels of beer that's that's what you know the ab imbev alliance does today so that's an amazing feat but it is hard to grow a company if you want to keep your quality up and you know it's it's just <coughs> personnel and and, uh, and the materials and how you do it. And you have to really kind of approach things with a quality mind all the time and, and get every one of your employees to do the same. Well, if you're the, if you're the last beer on the list in the, in, the, in the tavern, the last one they bought, and then you run out, you're probably not going to be invited back. And, and then you've also got the problem, uh, a lot of the distributorships in the, in the United States were, in fact, controlled by AB or the other the other brewers, there's a moment when the local distributor that you were using was, uh, was going to be sold. 
so how do, how do you survive in, in being, being the smallest guy in, a, in an industry that has really huge competitors? Well, that is, it, it, it is tough. But, you know, we are who we are. We're the real thing. You know, it's hard to compete with that. Uh, and it's interesting because, you know, really the beer revolution is happening in America. And it's happening, actually, because, you know, they're still today, after Prohibition, they put in the law that this three-tier system that we have today, which uh, allows for independent beer distributors. So even though they might be a Bud or uh, Miller or Coors distributor, they are technically independent uh, businesses. Technically, but an amazing number of them have Bush last names or are related to the Bush yeah, family. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's daunting, <laughs> but um, that's one of the reasons that this uh, beer revolution that's going on now in America is happening, is we have access to market. And if you went to Belgium or Germany or France today, you wouldn't have that same access. You would have to put in your own distribution infrastructure. And that's one of the reasons that America is so rife with uh, fantastic beer today. Right, 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 right. Um, and so you, you've expanded over time. How many states are you in now? You know, I think we're in parts of... 18 or 19 states. And you've got a, a fairly substantial market share in Kansas City. You're you know, we do. Uh, I think 35 plus percent of our business is right here in Kansas City. We think that's our most... So thank you. So I need to say thank you to all of you for uh, supporting us. It really helps. And I think it's the most important part of our business. And we... You know, as the business has developed, we we still think this is the most important part of our business, and then we look regionally, and then we look in the right. And outer you, you talked uh, talk to me about three plans. You've got three sort of concentric circles of of development. You've got in in some places like Omaha and and in St. Louis. I think you're doing doing well in in the region, and and you, you're able to continue to do that despite the competition. Not only now from uh, from you know, the ABs and the, the Millers of the world, but, but some pretty stiff craft competition from some of your compadres in the craft beer market. Absolutely. I mean, you know, it's funny. Uh, the brewing industry is a very open industry when it comes to how we make the beer. And, you know, we all get together and talk about, we, we write articles and share information. So from the backside of the breweries, it's very congenial. But when it comes to selling beer on the street every day, it gets ugly sometimes so you know but you're you you do uh, you, you you've had good relationships with a lot of these folks they some of them have taught you a lot and you've had 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 some folks that you've 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 worked with very closely including now you're doing some collaborations with some of your your competitors which i find i find really interesting i don't ever remember ab and miller collaborating on on anything but you've got a collaboration with uh, one of your competitors yeah in, we uh, do Oregon. uh we've done two of these now the first one was with the orval <laughs> brewery in uh belgium and so we did a collaboration. He really came over, the head brewer there, Jean-Marie, came over and we did a beer at the brewery, which was very unique. It was a lager beer. It was a lager beer. And then um, the uh, second one was with the Schutz Brewing Company out in Bend, Oregon. And they're about our size, and we like those guys. And so right. we decided to make a beer kind of with Northwest hops and then wheat beer, which is kind of something we're... Known for, uh, known for. So. Yeah, yeah. The Orval beer, the Belgian beer, was that one of the Belgian beers that you were drinking in the Lux in the in the bar near the Luxembourg Garden? No, you know, actually, that was a really interesting thing. We sort of let Jean Marie decide what he wanted to make. He's this kind of crazy, works for the monks, you know, and uh, but he's not a monk, and uh, but he wanted to make this really simple lager beer, and so we were kind of afraid that people wouldn't think it was so great, but people really thought it was a, a spectacular beer, and I thought so too. And it was so simple, it was such a simple recipe, which is what made it very, very interesting. That's great, and you're, you're doing some other collaborations with some other local businesses, some other great entrepreneurial businesses that some folks in the audience will certainly know, the Roastery and, and Christopher Elbow Chocolates, and, and, and talk about that for a second, what you're doing with them. Well, yeah, you know, I. Actually, Stephen uh, Powell's our head brewer. His wife, who used to work at the brewery, works for Christopher Elbow, and somehow they decided to make a chocolate beer. And actually, when I heard about it, I was like, uh, go ahead, but that didn't sound very good to me, you know. So, 
And, uh, but anyway, they made the beer. And then when I tasted it in tasting, I was really impressed with it. And so we made kind of the usual amount, maybe 1,800 cases of this beer. Uh, and it just evaporated off the shelves. And then people went all over town looking for it and called us. Many people called very unhappy with us. And, you know... It was oh. nothing we planned. It was, right. People thought that was a great marketing strategy. Well, not really. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so how many, how many beers do you have now? I know there are a lot of seasonal beers that you don't offer all the time, but in the course of a year, of course of this year, how many beers will Boulevard sell, different beers? You know, I think we have something like 27 or 8 beers wow. right now. That's stunning. Uh, a lot of that is due to the Smokestack series. So they're, you know, beers that we make either... Uh, once a year or once and then we're done with it right and and from an economic point of view is that is that economically uh, I mean we're, we're in front of your bankers here so you know if you need to whisper <laughs> but um, is that does that does that work relatively well economically or do you do some of that just to keep people interested you know no the smokestack line is more expensive and there's good margins in it but it does take a lot of time some of those beers age for a year in wood barrels and that kind of thing so there's a lot of you know, cost in both materials and labor that we have. But, um, you know, we, uh, we need to stay in business, so right. we try, well, to, make, we yeah, try to make money. Is that the right answer for the yeah, bankers? Yeah, it's yeah. good. good <laughs> bankers are still smiling. It's good. Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> Didn't want to and, say the wrong thing. Yeah, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, we, so we, we were careful there, yeah. Um, you, you, one, another thing that you've done that I think is is, is remarkable and some people here will will know about it but you've, you've given back to the community in a lot of ways I mean one one way is simply in the place where you started and really where you started in your carpentry business in your father's building on Southwest Boulevard you stayed right there and you've built you've built a very big business and employed a lot of people on the west side of Kansas City uh, <laughs> You know, I mean, and, and that may be the most important thing you've done to, to give back is to keep to keep people employed here. You also live on the west side, and uh, and you've given back in a lot of ways. One of, one of the things you might you might tell us about is a, a new venture, a relatively new venture of yours, the Ripple uh, venture. Tell, yeah. Great. Well, you know that kind of came out actually. Um, uh, my plan engineer, a guy named Mike Hutz, I don't think Mike's here today, but uh, he, uh, that was our idea. Actually, it started out, we thought we would make our own glass beer bottles in Kansas City. And we spent the first couple of years researching that just to realize that, um, well, I don't think the bank was going to loan us $100 million to start a, a glass, <laughs> glass plant. They're plant. fairly capital intensive, but we learned a lot about glass and why it makes sense to recycle glass. And I've always been a big recycler. And so, you know, we just started kind of connecting the dots. We said there were, we found out that there were, there was a, a company here in Kansas City, Owens Corning, that would gladly buy all the glass we could, all the glass that we use in Kansas City, all the consumer glass that we have every day in our homes, they would gladly take this material. And uh, so, and then across the street from them is certain teed and they would take just as much. So we thought, well, we've got a local customer, what's missing? So the missing part was a processing facility. And um, so we built, decided to build the processing facility, but what's unique about it is, is that we also are behind the collection piece of it. So um, that's the idea is to try to get people to, and you know, people have done a good job so far. I think we're up to probably 13%. We were probably only doing two or 3% before we started. In, and in, in Kansas City in as, Kansas as a whole. City. And we <laughs> hope to get that up to hopefully 100% someday. You right. know? Hey, that's great. So look, look for your, your, your purple bins around, yeah. uh, around town. So my plug to you all, if you're not recycling your glass, start. And if your neighbors aren't recycling their glass, uh, get them to. <laughs> okay, great. And and to to do that, I mean, I think this is a good practical uh, question. You're uh, you're on the internet. You're you know you're, you can be easily found. It's called Ripple. Right. We have 75 or 85 uh, Ripple glass bins all over the city, both Kansas, Missouri, 
And we're also um, working with Deffenbaugh to uh, develop a, a commercial uh, piece of this, which would be bars and restaurants. Yeah, I, I think uh, I, I read somewhere that 100... Right. <laughs> There's 150 million tons of glass that goes into uh, to landfills every year. If we get, and it's all it's all stuff that can be recycled. So that that that, that that's a fabulous thing. Well, I I want to ask you a really basic question. You can answer this any any way you want. But what do you think is the secret of your success, John? Well, um, I don't know. <laughs> I really it's good, don't. It's a good answer. I don't know. You know, I'm. I. I, I find myself. I think I'm a pretty practical guy. I'm uh, very. Pro, uh, you know, we did some personality test, or our sales guy did some years ago, and and I, you know, it was one of these. I don't know, psychological testing things, and I was definitely process oriented person, you know, and so I think that fits with going to art school. It fits with being a cabinet maker. It fits with starting a a business making a real commodity. So I think those things, and then, you know, I have to admit my father, who I think was a great businessman, he uh, taught me a lot and was really a practical guy. And, and so I think it's really a lot of common sense kind of stuff. That right. Well, the, obviously there's a, you know, anytime you see the, the beautiful gleaming equipment at Boulevard Brewery, take the tour. If you've never taken the tour, it's fabulous. Um, you, you, there must be some part engineer in your in your soul, but there's also and a lot of imagination. I mean, anybody who can come up with single wide beer and then add double wide beer, uh, you know, <laughs> is, is a guy with some imagination. Um, you know, and obviously you've got a sense of fun. This has obviously been fun for you, I think, uh, through your, your career. Is that, is that a fair statement? You know, it's true. There's an element to brewing and, and beer. It is a, you know, it's a hospitality. It's in the hospitality world, and so, uh, you know, there's a lot of bad things about alcohol, obviously. We all know what those are, and, and, but I think there's a lot of good things, you know. Uh, you know, it's a great beverage that um, people should be proud of, yeah. and, and it shows location and place, and, and uh, I think it's a thing we're really proud of at the brewery. Well, yeah, another thing you, you said is that you're proud to be a brewer. It's an honorable profession. It's, it's one of the great old, old honorable professions. I think that's right. 7,000 years. 7,000 seven, seven, 7, years. So what, what do you do next? You're making wine now. We make a little bit of wine. Uh, it's more, yeah. You know, I like wine, but it's also a hobby, more of a hobby than right. it is a, you know, something we're trying to make money off of. And uh, it is also part of our retail liquor licensing that we have at the, uh, at the brewery. So there's a little bit of that involved, but... But it's been an interesting project, and yeah, it's been fun. Great. Well, I, I, I want uh, to turn this over to, if it's okay with you, to the audience to ask a, a few questions. But I, but I do want to, I, I do want to finish this this part by uh, saying, you know, like like the, the the name of one of your more recent beers, Dark Truth. Uh, it's it, it, thank you. Yeah. Uh, it, 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 it's great. It's great to hear your story because I think it, it is. It's a, it not only an honorable profession, but you've done so much for the for the city, and you've made an awful lot of the rest of us happy uh, and have fun. <laughs> so I want to th I want to thank you, John McDonald, for what you've done. For well, Kansas thank you, city. Crosby. Thanks for having me. Yeah, are, are you up for a few questions from sure, the audience? Absolutely. Okay, uh, I, I'll try and repeat the the question. I don't think we've got any microphones, so good. If you had to do it over again, would you do it? Um, probably, yeah, I think so, you know? <laughs> yeah, I had to think about it. I mean, it, you know, it was uh, pretty scary times back in the day, and, you know, it's still a challenge, you know, but, uh, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's been quite rewarding. Maybe a question over here. The Tank 7 story, that's one of the new beers. I can tell you the Tank 7 story. The Tank 7, actually, the first, uh, we wanted to make a farmhouse ale uh, in the Smoke Sack series, and we made one, and we called it Saison, which is what those styles are called in Belgium. But people in America can't say Saison. I can't say it. I mean, you feel weird, like, give me a Saison. What is it? You know, nobody knows. And so 
the beer really didn't sell very well, even though we really liked it. And then when we made the uh, um, um, Saison Brett, which was a bigger... Sa <laughs> yeah, that guy, I know he likes it. Uh, you know, it was a much bigger, a little bit bigger, more alcohol, a little hoppier beer for this bigger uh, Brett beer that we were making. We all kind of liked that recipe. And it was made in tank seven. And, you know, we, we do these test brews at the brewery. And, frankly, they don't have a name. They're just a beer that we've, we're making. So the brewers give these beers names. And I can't repeat some of them. <laughs> but that one was always called tank seven. And so, uh, actually, Jeremy Ragonies is here. And he's our head of marketing. And he, was, he thought that was the worst name he'd ever heard for, for a beer, was totally adamant that we not do it. But I think the brewers were so uh, persistent, they just said, you got to name it Tank 7, and we did. And I think Jeremy thinks it's probably a good name now because it sells really well. Now, your, your sister just snuck up behind me, and, and as I think Henry, Henry mentioned, John's sister Carrie is, is, a, is one of the world's great librarians. She also was secretary, the original, I think, secretary of the company, she tells me. And we've asked her to re-register your stock in the name of the library. Um, <laughs> but but she, she said I should ask you uh, this, to tell the story of Bob's 47. You know, that's a good story. Uh, actually, when I first started the brewery, I had a consultant out of Seattle named Charlie McElvey, who was, uh, uh, really helped us. He was a German-trained brewer. And... Um, but uh, four or five months after I started, this guy named Boots, I don't know, he had a restaurant called Boots and Coats, and he called me and he said, I have this old friend, and he used to be a brewer at the Mulebach Brewery. He'd like to come down and see your brewery. So he brought, brought him down, and, you know, Bob lived in a rest home then. He had, his wife had died some years before. He had two artificial, he had, uh, was a bad diabetic. He also drank a case of beer a day, he told me, for his entire adult life, so that might have been part of his problem. Um, but he walked on two um, canes, but he was an incredibly practical brewer that had been in the Mulebach Brewery since he was 17 years old and just had this wealth of knowledge. And so he would come down to the brewery uh, once a week, usually he'd take a, either a friend would bring him or he'd take a taxi. And after we were done working, we'd sit around and drink beer with Bob, and he'd tell us all these great stories about working in these old breweries back in the, you know, 40s and 50s and 60s. And, um, and he would sometimes, he was an excellent cook, and he made great head cheese. So he would bring down head cheese, and we would drink, eat head cheese and drink beer. And so uh, we came up with this, we asked him one day, a common question, what was the best beer you ever had, Bob? And he said, well, when I was going to brewing school in New York City with my wife back in 1947, we made this Münchner-style beer. That was the best beer I ever had. Of course, it was probably because he was in New York City and he was happy. And, you know, that's usually when your best beer is, is when you're really happy. Anyway. And um, so, anyway, we wanted to name this. We made a beer uh, in the spirit of the beer Bob had made in, in uh, 1947, and uh, we named it after him, which we thought he would be flattered, uh, and I think he was really flattered, but he liked our pale ale best. <laughs> <laughs> so he always told me that. He goes, yeah, it's okay, but I like the pale ale better. <laughs> anyway. Boston, Washington, New York, if you, you know, he's going to distribute actually, there. You uh, know, actually, Crosby mentioned earlier, uh, you know, like I said, our main business is here local. Then we look regionally. And with our Smokestack series, we think those beers are fantastic and can hunt any place in the United States. And so we are actually looking at Massachusetts as sort of a test market. And I think we'll probably do Smokestack only in Massachusetts later this year. I don't know when we'll be in Washington. We just don't know yet. Okay. Maybe somebody over here. Uh, 
Um, yeah, you know, the Nutcracker is a fresh hop beer. That's, we've been doing that. We were probably one of the first breweries in the country to do that. And so when you drink Can the Nutcracker... Can you explain what fresh hop is? Well, that's where, uh, you know, hops typically are dried once they're picked out in the state of Washington is where we get most of them. And they either pelletize them, but they have to dry them to a certain degree or they'll just explode like a wet hay bale so, or catch on fire. So... Um, but what we do with these fresh hops is the day they pick them, we actually fly them. We air freight them in from uh, Washington, and then we use them immediately to make the beer. And it gives a really fresh sort of piney, citrus uh, background in the beer. And, yeah, I think it's a great, uh, a really neat thing. Um, what else? Oh, my favorite beers? You know, huh? Non-Boulevard. Non -boulevard. Non yeah, no, 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 I heard beers. that. Uh, you know, I've always been a big fan of Bohemia. Is a Mexican beer is a great one for me for just an easy drinking beer. Of course, I love Sierra Nevada. They do great. Um, I also like Orval and Duval or my, and West Molly and a lot of the Belgian. I'm a very Belgian. I like the Belgian beers a lot. I, I like hoppy beers, but I'm, my own palate is more towards the less hop. More, so more malt. different malty more background malty. type beers. Yeah, great. Maybe right over here. This is a question for, for Anne, uh, John's wife, about what, what she thought uh, at the time. Uh, was this a good idea? Okay, can you hear me? Um, you know, to tell you the truth, I didn't think that much about it. We were kind of poor, and it was an idea, and if we failed, we wouldn't be living any differently. <laughs> so, that's, I just, that was the way it was. <laughs> you know, from the study of entrepreneurship point of view, that may be the single most profound thing said here tonight. Thanks, Ann. There's a guy. You know, there's been several of those beers, and, and there's been some beers that we've actually come out with that we've pulled out of production. You know, it's interesting. Uh, I don't know if any of you remember a beer we made back in the 90s called Ten Penny. It was probably mid-90s. It was uh, my idea. I'll take all the uh, blame for it. It was... Uh, you know, it was kind of when alcohol driving laws were, you know, that were really starting to get strict. And I really thought that there would be a market for very low alcohol beers with more flavor. And so we made this 10 penny. But back then, when you told a beer consumer in Kansas City that the beer only had 2.7% alcohol, uh, they felt cheated and, and uh, cheated yeah, out th of Those of us beer. who grew up on 3.2 beer, that's yeah. not, not a good memory. But I think, it's a, I think it's a style of beer that was just before its time because a lot of small breweries, you know, the, the, the trend in brewing for small breweries has been make these big, highly alcoholic beers, you know, which really have a place. I mean, I, I, I like those beers. But, you know, if you're going to go out, um, you know, and be with your friends, you don't want to be stumbling around and, you know, not get the girl at the end of the night, you know. So... Uh, <laughs> You know, really, I think moderate alcohol beers or lower alcohol beers are a really smart thing that people need to look at. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. I don't think any of them have broken yet, but... Uh... <laughs> yeah, these are all going to end up in ripple glass. We were actually going to have some bins here, but we'll, we'll make sure they end up in the bin. Yeah, if you, if you can get them back to the table or someplace where we can find them, you'll, we'll, we'll, we'll recycle all of them. Are you ever going to go public, John? Are you going to be, be, be available in the stock market? You know, I've learned <laughs> you should never say never about any, really anything. And, uh, but really, I don't see that for us. I mean, it's uh, definitely not something I see in the near future. And, um, you know, there, there's some breweries that did that back in the mid-90s, and all of them, too, have had trouble. So, you know, it's just 
something I don't think we need. And as long as we have a friendly bank, you know, that's all we need. Right, <laughs> right, right. Is, what's the best market in the country for craft beers? Is it Seattle or Denver? Or? You know, the highest per capita consumption of craft beer is the Northwest, which is about 32% of all beer consumed is craft beer. So, and, versus, and versus about 6 or 8% in Kansas City? I think City. probably 6 or 8% here. More than that, probably 9 or 10 actually okay. now. And, um, I, yeah, I do. And, and really, at the end of the day, um, there's only so much beer that is going to be consumed. And right now, the big, the big two, which are, you know, ABI and South African Breweries and Miller Brewing Company, Coors, they have probably 85 share of our market in the United States. And then imports have another seven or eight, and we have six or seven percent. So that's how it shakes out. And really, I think to, you know, it's a great thing if you think about the job creation um, created by small local breweries, it's, it's enormous. You know, the fact that we are somewhat inefficient, and I kind of touched on this earlier, but you know, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that, you know, if you're a big, big, giant company, the way you cut costs is you uh, cut costs. And how do you cut costs? You get rid of people and you make things more efficient. And it's a great idea. And in fact, our brewery, we, we try to do that. But if you look at it in a real simplistic way, at the end of the day, if a guy doesn't have a job, he can't buy a case of beer, and ultimately you're out of business. So... You know, I, I th and I think we're kind of going that way, and we're seeing some of the effects of that in America today. And so, and I don't know how to do it, but like I said, I think we start. We need to start connecting the local dots and figuring out how to, you know, get keep business in Kansas City, start new businesses in Kansas City, and and create jobs because we want people to be able to afford a case of Boulevard beer. So great. <laughs> One of the very first investments you made, I think, if I've got this right, tell me, uh, is it's some Bavarian uh, beer making equipment. I mean, you bought some stuff in Europe that you brought over to, to start the brewery. Yeah, the first brew house, we I think we paid thirty five thousand dollars for it. It's still in the brewery. It's an amazing piece. And still, we use it today. So, you know, it was a good investment. But um, yeah, it's you know, it's it was hard back in the day. But uh, you know, I've had great help and and frankly uh, I shouldn't put a plug I'm gonna put a plug in for UMB they've been great partners uh, you know and and really uh, a good bank is a good advisor you know they they say uh, well maybe you ought to think about that and that, that's not a bad thing you know so uh, always getting your putting your hand out and getting it filled sometimes isn't the best thing so yeah. I, I don't know you know but I think you know you need to and, and really uh, you know as a as a business owner, I really do uh, believe that um, it's the people you put around you that are going to make your business go. And to create a, a business where people want to do the right thing and, and, and uh, you know, everybody cares about every bottle of beer that you make at the end of the day is, is what you need to instill in, in your people. And, and if you do that, you'll hopefully be successful. And you know what? Luck is a huge piece of any <laughs> entrepreneurial endeavor, so uh, I have to say that. L ladies and gentlemen, John McDonald.